Now, we're talking now about other treatment and alternative medicine, complementary medicine, uh, and we have practitioners from different, uh, different fields of practice, and I'll have them introduce themselves to you. On the farthest right, I'm Lucia Marks. I'm a nurse practitioner and a psychologist, and I work with Quest Center for Integrative Health, which was called Project Quest through most of the early days and even till recently. And we've worked a lot with HIV and AIDS since 1988. And I'm David Eisen, and I'm a licensed acupuncturist and a doctor of oriental medicine. And I'm now currently the executive director of the Quest Center, but worked the last 20 years working with homeless and marginalized populations with comorbid disorders, including HIV and AIDS. I'm David Rosenstein. I was the founder and director of the Russell Street Dental Clinic. Uh, I was at Oregon Health Sciences University. I've been treating people who are HIV positive exclusively for uh, since 1983, and at one point we were treating approximately 75 to 80 percent of the people who were infected with this virus in this state, some of the surrounding states. It's probably down to about 50 percent now. So, and I'm Jack Cox, uh, and I'm uh, representing Treatment Information Exchange today. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about is sort of the history from the very beginning of this disease up until the middle 90s uh, when there was a significant change. Um, so first let's talk about what it was like early on and anybody can start talking about that from his particular or her particular I'll jump in. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not shy. <laughs> um, the early years were frightening. They were frightening for everybody. They were frightening for the patients. They were frightening for the practitioners. Um, everything that I pick up is sharp, except for my sense of humor, and uh, I've, I've stuck myself with those sharp things on three separate occasions, and it was frightening. It was frightening for the patients who had come to me and, and knew that the life expectancy was pretty limited for people who had a diagnosis of AIDS back then. And it was, pa patients were coming in very sick. They were coming in in walkers, they were coming in emaciated. Uh, they, 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 they looked like they had, had suffered through a concentration camp. Um, they had lesions on their face, they had difficulty walking. Uh, it was just a, a terrible time and there was hope back then, but um, although there was hope, uh, many people knew that they were, they were whistling in the dark. And it was, it was a time when patients who were told, well, you, you need your six-month checkup, knew that there wouldn't be a, a six-month checkup. And it was, um, it was very discouraging to see the amount of illness and death, and very encouraging to see the people who wanted to do something about it and make a difference. And I would say that in those times, there was also an incredible energy of people helping and supporting each other. And there was a spirit that I felt so much at that time where people were <coughs> facing the struggles of not knowing how am I going to take care of myself and if I die, who will be with me? And at that time, actually, I began to do imagery and work with people in creating the inner states that would support a healthier feeling within your body and had been shown to help make some changes possible too. And people were excited about doing the work and willing to work really hard. And I know for myself and for other people who were caregivers, the amount of love and willingness of people to help each other was profound. And I've worked with a lot of other illnesses, but I never experienced anything as profound as those days and the love that I felt and connection as people died and a circle would be around them of support and love. And the, what people went through to help each other to change, to stop smoking, stop using drugs or alcohol or any changes 
so that one could live and thrive for a longer time. So it was a very inspirational time, though a very painful time. Uh, I don't know how much to add to that. I think David and Lucia pretty much summed it up. However, I was in Boston at the time when HTLV3 was still the nomenclature that was used. And the AIDS Action Committee had just formed, and I was asked to help form the holistic therapies team of the AIDS Action Committee. And it was made up basically of people living with HIV and AIDS, who were chiropractors, who were doctors of oriental medicine, who were podiatrists, that who were, uh, one dentist, as a matter of fact, was there. And I was struck by the enormous amount of compassion by the people, but also the enormous amount of anger, and needing a vehicle by which to channel that anger in a constructive way. And it kept me going, having that, that, that anger channeled in a constructive way, because it was very easy. There were no resources available. There was no national policy developed. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was quite the disease that we just wish would keep on happening to certain populations at the time, we being the dominant culture, obviously not the people sitting at this dais. Um, and most of the resources that were de developed were within the community. People said, we want options, we want something else besides 1,600 to 2,000 milligrams of AZT a day. Uh, people were talking about developing community around supporting each other, not only in trying to live, but also in the dying process. And where Chinese medicine and alternative medicine came in in that point was very much in an ancillary and adjunct uh, capacity. Uh, because all we were, I mean, people were literally coming in the door looking like right out of the Auschwitz. And it was, um, it was scary because nobody had any experience. We were, we were shooting in the dark. Yeah, the, it's, as I recall, um, there were so few resources, there were no financial resources around, and so there was a lot of cost shifting, or people were oh. taking money from one program to, to make services available that, that weren't funded for people. That, that's what we did at our clinic. We had funds from, the Oregon Health Plan had just started, and um, uh, we were receiving a significant amount of of funds from the Oregon Health Plan. It's a capitation plan, so the, we would receive full funding in the beginning, even though patients hadn't scheduled appointments. So we had a, a surplus of funds, and we used that to support the care for people who are HIV positive for whom there were no funds. Um, and in the early days of HIV, uh, people's insurance ran out, and what you had was a group of people who were sophisticated enough to use the system never had to use the system before, and even though they were sophisticated, had trouble doing so, had trouble getting on Medicare, had trouble getting on, on Medicaid, uh, didn't know we had a turn when they were turned down. And it was, if I recall correctly, it was, a lot of it was just arbitrary. You'd have one person who would get on with the same lab values that were uh, denied uh, to another person, and it was a. Uh, uh, people just didn't have resources. There were really no resources for uh, mental health at that time when it was so crucially needed. And most of what occurred were people who would volunteer, and initially they'd volunteer through CAP. Some of them would have experience, but often they'd be people who were compassionate but did not. And most of the work that we did in those early days was volunteer work. That's how our center actually came about, because we came to the point where myself and others, three-fourths of what we were doing, we were doing as volunteers. And a young man with AIDS had a dream about starting a program and wrote the grant to get us to be a nonprofit. So eventually, we could get funds. But they were challenging times. In my experience with the uh, clinic that I helped found and run for homeless folks, uh, we're, got together with uh, some people around this table to start what was and still is the only integrated medical program in the city for people living with HIV and AIDS, uh, bringing together f very different organizations and very different people with a vision to saying all people have a right, not a privilege, to medical care of their choice. And we were able, with that kind of intent, to lobby uh, policy makers and get um, Ryan White federal dollars geared toward, which was very significant, it was the first 
place in the country to do this, uh, dollars toward complementary medicine. And it was still to this day is the fifth highest used category within Ryan White land. Uh, and it's out of there that I've had the most experience working with people in an integrated model. And I believe that that's ultimately when we start looking at chronic diseases such as HIV and AIDS is today, that we need to look at treating everybody from, all, I hate the word, but it's the best I can come up with right now, a holistic you know, viewpoint. So uh, who doesn't get care who, in, this, in this day and age? In, in this day and age, um, there are a number of people who fall through the cracks. First of all, uh, Ryan White funds are available for people who are at 200% or better of poverty. So if you're above 200% of poverty, that sounds, you know, 200%. You know, 100% sounds good, right? Well, 100% isn't good. 100% means that, you know, you're, you're making um, approximately what would be paid for, for minimum wage, and if, if, if you understand what that'll do for you, um, you're, you're gonna make about $800 a month, and you're gonna pay rent of about $600 a month. Anybody can work out what they're gonna do with the other 200 and, in terms of eating and transportation and do that successfully, more power to them. I don't think that can be done. So people above 200% of poverty probably between 200 and 500% and of poverty are, are, are in trouble. That's one group. A second group are people who are, <laughs> are at any level of income who don't happen to live in one of the five counties covered by Ryan White Title I. Those people are, are, are out of luck. Um, people who have jobs that do not have health insurance associated with it are out of luck. The Ryan White Care Act doesn't cover people who are medically indigent. In other words, people who if they had to pay 2,000 a month for their medication would be be below 200% of poverty. It doesn't cover that. So we don't have a system that, that provides for medical indigency. So those folks who have reasonable jobs but do not have health insurance, that may not sound like a lot of people. It's probably 15% of the public don't, maybe 20 do not have health insurance through their jobs. Some people have only catastrophic health insurance. So there are people who have health insurance and they can't afford the deductible, which could be as high as three and four and five thousand dollars. The the other people that don't get care are people that are underinsured, where they have minimal coverage um, and or they have caps. So let's say that you're living with the disease and you come back from the precipice, you've been through our house and you're trying to get back and establish, but your mental health benefit has run out or your dental benefit has run out or your other benefits that have run out. So then you have to go back to the dilemma that David pointed at. I'm making 756, which is FPL right now, dollars a month. And so do I buy my therapy or do I eat? Do I heat my house or do I eat? And this is, this is untenable. This is an obscene situation for most, for us to be even having to discuss around this table today. I think the other people that don't get covered are people that are stigmatized within their communities where they don't feel safe and secure coming out, letting people know, first of all, they haven't been tested, number one, or if they have been tested, number two, they don't feel comfortable coming out and saying, I've got this disease, I need help. And that's very dangerous for lots, for themselves and for other people in their community. I think it's very challenging for women also. I think there's so many barriers with childcare and all the other needs. We have a program now, our Women of Wisdom, WOW, that occurred actually by people within the whole HIV community coming together and brainstorming and saying these women need service. But it serves a small number and the needs of the people are really great and there needs to be a lot more support and outreach towards all the folks, such as women or stigmatized groups, who presently don't have access. Uh, early on in this disease, it was estimated that uh, most of the people who had HIV were about 75% uh, dual diagnosable, that they, that they had HIV and that they probably were addicted to something. Is that, is that a true? 
Is that, that's true? probably true of people who are HIV negative. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, could be. I think, you know, co-occurring disorders, uh, particularly psychiatric and substance abuse or mental health, I'd say anywhere between 68 and 75 percent is a, a very workable and realistic number. I think in our clinic in particular, it's higher than that. Uh, I know most primary care clinics don't address those issues. Here in Multnomah County, we're lucky we have program, programs within that particular clinic, which is a primary clinic for a lot of people living with HIV needs within the EMA, understand the need for people to have services to address those issues because if you're actively using heroin or actively using heroin and drinking, the likelihood that you're compliant with your medical program and protocol is going to be really low. If you're actively using and homeless and need to med uh, have refrigeration for your medication is low too. And I, did we just get signal? Oh, okay. Well, there are two, two things that I want to say. One is that uh, this state is in better shape than most. If you look at states like New Jersey, if you look like the District of Columbia, um, those are places where the majority of people uh, who are HIV infected uh, are infected through the use of drugs, which means that, that the majority of people are co have comorbidity, and that's before you even look at issues like mental illness. Just by virtue of how they got the virus, they have comorbidity. Um, and I agree that uh, with, with what you said with respect to um, uh, adhering to drug regimen, um, unfortunately, that is not a universal uh, um, uh, finding, and there are practitioners and providers who uh, are reluctant to provide the um, heart therapy to people who do abuse drugs because they're they're concerned about um, uh, whether or not these folks will will adhere to the drug schedules. When you consider how difficult it is to score your heroin every day <laughs> and to and to stay high. Uh, these are folks that are able to stay on a schedule pretty nicely in terms of their drug schedule. And uh, I'm not 100% certain that uh, uh, the discrimination against this group of, of patients is, is uh, rational. Um, I think it's actually unfortunate. I think that's and I know nobody here is suggesting that that should, should happen. I think the discrimination, however, goes even deeper than that. It's even getting in the door to get services, let alone get the appropriate medical care. I am poor, I'm white and disheveled, I'm poor, I'm drug seeking, I'm drug using, I'm black and disheveled. You're different, you don't belong here. And in the days up until very recently of white, middle class, gay, male dominated cultural paradigm, for social services and case management kinds of services, not necessarily here, but in other major urban areas, it was definitely a barrier to accessing care. I, I think it was here as well. Yeah. And I would say that the amount of former uh, people who've had abuse in their past, and so there is an element of post-traumatic stress, that if you've had abuse in the past, it's much harder to say no to a lot of things. So there's a huge core mit comorbidity with what one could call a mental health diagnosis that is treatable and that can really be a big part of prevention also. So um, we're about halfway through with this. Let's talk a little bit about um, what, what do you think, we, where do we need to go? Um, in we, we need to do a number of things. You know, we still are doing nothing with prevention. 40,000 people convert to this virus every year like clockwork. I mean, it's just disgraceful. Um, I, there, there are so many of the, these figures that I just don't understand. I don't understand how people can expose themselves to the virus uh, and, and do so in such large numbers. I don't understand how we lose the same number of people from drunk driving every year either. There are a number of things that we allow in society that I think we can get a handle on it, just as we can get a handle on drunk driving. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Um, I believe we can get a handle on uh, prevention. Well, how do you get a handle on prevention? When was the last time anyone on this panel or anybody saw on TV an ad about preventing HIV by showing kids how to use condoms? The next time I see that will be the first time. It isn't enough to say 
stop aids. Stop aids doesn't say or do anything. Show a kid how to use a condom. These kids think condoms can be reused. I mean, as silly as that sounds, you, the, you see studies that say, show significant numbers of kids think it can be reused. They think that if you pull out, that, that you're safe. You're not safe. I mean, there are so many things that we're not giving information to these folks at school that we need to do that could help prevent the transmission of this virus. We are doing nothing about finding out who has this virus. You know, it is your right and your choice to take the medication or not, but you should at least know what your situation is so you can make that informed choice. We're doing nothing about it. Yes, the District of Columbia is trying to test everybody, and, and people look at that like, are you kidding me? It's a joke. I'm looking at that and thinking, why aren't we doing that in this community? So we need to, to talk about prevention in a way that we get it across, and we need to um, do something about identifying people who harbor this virus and, and so that they can seek care. There are limited dollars allocated to each area, and when I think of, again, the area of mental health, which I'm most familiar with, if dollars are allotted so that you're given a limited number of sessions and the point of it is not towards helping people make major changes in their lives who may have significant trauma in their background, that is not a short-term fix. It takes a longer time and it takes a sense of both individual work and group work. You can help people change their lives, become advocates and help in the area of prevention if you give the time and attention to building that. And always having to ration mental health dollars or to look at the situation as I mentioned earlier with women where as women begin to feel a sense of community and connection they begin to be more able to deal with situations they may have of domestic violence or painful things in their life that will help them be better parents and help them take care of themselves. But if there aren't the dollars that support that kind of treatment that will effectively work, if you put the money in, you save the money because you're able to have problems be much more resolved. If you put a little money in, you just kind of dribble along and take care of things in the moment, but it's not going to be in the long term an effective solution. I think it's more than money. I think it's it's a, a will. It's an effort, and 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 we haven't done that as as a, a, a society, um, you know. And it started very early. It started at the beginning of the epidemic when you had a president who never used the word. AIDS for, for the bulk of his presidency when, you know, you, you had a situation where you had the uh, um, Legionnaire's disease which affected military retirees and, and CDC just went nuts to, to figure yeah. out exactly what happened because God help us, 30 or 40 people got sick. And, you know, you could have 100,000 people die and there didn't seem to be that same amount of effort directed towards it. Well, you know, I, I agree with both of you. Unfortunately, I think there is, a, there is a dearth of leadership, and I think that things like homophobia and racism and, and class mm -hmm. distinction are major cultural components of our society that we continually have to fight against, not only treat people around or teach our kids how to use condoms, but organize around what the hell is it going to take not to do a preemptive war based on lies where we're spending over billions of dollars and we've got to sit around this table arguing about, well, gee, should a homeless person have alcohol and free housing if they've got a chronic disease and it's going to cost $6,000 a year per person and still with all the goddamn people, excuse me, that have the disease or that need the services, they don't have the option to do that. And it's infuriating as a provider, it's infuriating as a community member, it's, a com it's infuriating as a father, as a co-worker, and um, I still think one of the biggest prevention things that we can do is organize together to put pressure on making a cultural paradigm shift and forcing, very much like we forced people back in the late 80s to listen with groups like ACT UP, 
to say, we're here, we're not going away, you need to address issues, we're part of this community. Um, thank you. I, I agree with all of that. I was last year, I was on a, a campaign, the campaign to end AIDS shifted uh, an awareness for me. Uh, and I realized that I'd been sort of like in, in desperate mode with HIV for the last 21 years. And um, that I just saw it as an inevitability and that the best that we could hope for was managing those of us who have the disease, we could sort of manage it into a, but I had never gotten to the point of saying we can stop this thing. We have all the resources we need to stop it. What we don't have is the political will, and that's what you're talking about, and that's what it, you're talking about. That's exactly correct, Jack, and what's happened is that you have a situation where people think that uh, teaching religion in school makes sense, despite the prohibition in our Constitution, but teaching prevention to save these kids' lives, they're more interested in saving their souls than their lives. Now, I understand people have those values, and they're entitled to those values. They're not entitled to do it in a public building where I pay taxes, that, that, that just doesn't make any sense. I, for the life of me, I don't understand why these same groups of people that are out rallying about, uh, about what they rally about don't care, seem to care about the homeless, don't seem to care about people who are HIV infected. Um, I, I, just, I just find the whole situation very discouraging and very bizarre. But I, I think it's important that we, we, we build on small victories. Um, when we are closed in this, in this town, um, a group of people, both consumer activists and providers, got together to say women need services. And they formed uh, a small, albeit substantial, concept around that, that need. Today, you know, wow treats a hundred women, you know, and their kids. And it's those small victories where we look at, we need to keep teach these wow kids about condoms, you know, because many of their moms were in DV situations and we need to have a supportive community where that can happen because if we don't do it within ourselves, on when a you small say DV, level, you mean domestic violence. Dom I'm we sorry. Know that, but yes, thank the you. Audience may not. Domestic violence uh, or SA sexual assault. Um, so I think I think if I don't grab onto and embrace those small little steps forward, it can be overwhelming and and help. And that's how society works. They throw you a crumb, and you're supposed to say, "Thank you, thank you, thank you." We are so appreciative when all of the resources go to build a bridge to nowhere or whatever else they're going to build. And but each of us can be present and can be advocates, and each of us can build much more the fabric of community. And I believe that we can make a difference. And I think that what you each were saying about HIV and AIDS not being on TV with ads about prevention or other things in the here and now, that we need to have people know about HIV and that that's part of our task is to get into being part of the solution. And we can change, we can change the world, we can care. I mean, I believe the things that are happening more in Africa now where people are being empowered and the models there where when you help people be part of the solution and be part of how the, uh, solutions are going to come I'm about. I'm not a pessimistic person. I'm an optimistic person. Good. For the life of me, I do not understand how an industrialized nation can have 40,000 people every year get infected with this virus. So it's, so it's just beyond me. It is absolutely beyond me. I don't understand it. I just don't understand it. I consider myself a bright person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're uh, coming to an end. And uh, this has been the panel dealing with um, other treatment and alternative health care uh, and alternative treatments. Uh, dentistry, um, Chinese medicine and acupuncture and mental health. And uh, we have jointly concluded that um, we should all come to view HIV as a disease that can end. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to continue. It can end. We have everything that we need. Thank you.